Uh, voice is on? No. Okay. Yeah, it's on. That's the... Anyway, yeah, good evening, everybody. Glad you're here. Uh, if, if you think it's going to get cold here, ask Janice how cold it's up there in North mm -hmm. Carolina. <laughs> it's cold up there. But not as cold as some of the people I've been hearing from up in Illinois, Indiana. Man, they're oh, yeah. zero and 10 below, and it's like, uh, no, thank you. Anyway, uh, so, okay, we're still in the study of the book of Genesis. Um, and I really like tonight's uh, chapter, chapter 37. Uh, a bit better than I liked last week's chapter, you know, of <laughs> Esau's uh, genealogy mainly, you know. But, I mean, we gathered quite a bit out of Esau's genealogy. But, you know, I mean, it just, to me, I didn't see a whole lot of, you know, real deep benefit other than the fact that God is faithful throughout, you know. And, hey, Esau was Abra part of Abraham's descendancy, and because Abraham was chosen— Esau has importance in God's eyes, albeit it was, they weren't the nation of promise that came through Isaac and Jacob, you know, but uh, still they had a function to play as part of God's plan. And that's the big thing to take away. You have to look at everything biblically as being carried out according to God's plan. And a lot of times people say, well, why would this happen? Or why would God say this is going to happen? Well, it's because it's his plan. Now, sometimes he'll focus on an individual. Like tonight's story, he's going to focus mainly on Joseph. And when we look at what God does through Joseph, we can see that God had a plan. And I mean, even through his jealous brothers, uh, we see that God even had a plan through each of them, too, because, hey, they each of them became the head of one of the tribes of the of Israel, you know, for the 12 tribes of Israel. So, I mean, we can talk about that a little more a bit later when we maybe get into the blessings, when Jacob gives the blessings to his sons just before he dies. Because, I mean, sometimes, like we've talked about on Wednesdays, uh, Dan is sometimes left out of the genealogical line. And then sometimes what we see is that Joseph isn't brought up as an as a specific tribe. He's brought up as two tribes, Ephraim and Manasseh, which were his two sons. If you remember, Joseph blessed his sons. So you, when you look at the differences in how the tribes are identified, uh, I mean, if, if Joseph was to stay put and Dan was to stay put, the 12 would be fine. But the problem is you start seeing some of that change. And some of the things that have been mentioned, the one in particular, was that Dan, it's possible that the Antichrist may come out of the tribe of Dan. And so could that be a reason why Dan isn't mentioned as part of the 12? But the only reason I kind of jump off on that little track real, real shortly is because what we know is that God carries out his plan in spite of how we look at things or how we try to rationalize things or we try to say, well, why, why did God do it that way? Well, he did it that way because that's his plan and that's what he does. Now, yeah. one of the things that I see and we'll be looking at a lot closer tonight is God uses people. He, I mean, yes, God could make everything happen his way by his own doing, period. But that's not how God works. God works through his create, through his creatures, through his created beings. And we are all used at some level. And that includes those who haven't come into a saving relationship or a personal relationship with God, you know, in the Old Testament or through Jesus Christ in the New Testament. God can use any of his create uh, any of his creatures. Uh, we see he uses Satan. You know, I mean, it's not like Satan has free will to do anything he wants. God allows him to do certain things, but God is still in control. You can, we've already heard much of that in Job, right? I mean, Satan could only do what God allowed him to do. But in some cases, God allows Satan to be involved in part of his plan. 
Uh, now, one of the things that we're going to see with Joseph today is that, hey, when God uses you, it doesn't always mean that everything is just going to be peachy. Sometimes God has you go through different situations in life, and that's not as a discipline thing in the sense of a, a, a discipline for wrong, but it is a discipline for making you more into who God wants you to be according to his plan, how he, how he is using you in his overall master plan. Yeah. And we'll see that with Joseph. So don't forget that as we look at that part in Joseph. Because now I know Mary and Milton weren't in Sunday school on Sunday, but we started our study of faith. You know, we just finished up uh, uh, in the power of God's name and how God's name is used and how power is in it and how we worship his name and surrender to his name and, and, and et cetera, et cetera. But now we're picking up in faith. Okay, what is faith in our walk with the Lord? And guess what? Faith is a crucial element of having a relationship with God. As a matter of fact, think about Abraham. Uh, how was he saved? His say, he was saved because the Bible says his faith was counted unto him as righteousness. In other words, it was his trust in God and, and kind of associate trust, belief, and faith all together. Okay? Because as he believed God, he trusted God, that established his faith in God, even though he didn't see God at every moment. You know, unlike the disciples, they were with Jesus, with God, you know, for three years straight. And yet, even so, we see that many times the Lord would tell them, oh, ye of little faith, right? In other words, <laughs> I'm God, I'm here with you, and look at what God can do, you know, well, the Father through the Son can do, and you still don't believe? What's up with you guys? Come on, you know? And, uh, but we'll talk more about that as we go through the lesson today, because faith is a crucial element of walking with the Lord. As a matter of fact, Hebrews 4.12 says that without faith, it's impossible to please God. And so faith is something that is crucial because, hey, do you see the God walking around with you? Even though you know he's right here with you or with you wherever you are, do you see him? Do your senses, you know, acknowledge that he's right there? Not so much, not in the sense of how the, how he was with his disciples, you know, the 12 disciples. But he, guess what? He's always with you. The Bible says he'll never leave you or forsake you, right? Hebrews 13, 5. He's always with us. So the issue is, though, we accept that by faith. And think about faith this way, too. Faith isn't something that you and I generate alone. Faith is generated through our relationship with the Lord. He's the one that helps us in our faith. Uh, as a matter of fact, when we're saved, right? Uh, I mean, basically, it's not like we generate the faith to accept the, the gift of grace. Did you know that God gives us the faith? It's called saving faith. That yes. is what motivates us he draws us through that to accept the gift of grace of saving grace it, it's kind of a paradox you know it's like wow how does that work it, it's how god does things and it, it can be a little bit disconcerting at times because you're like well why how but what it is is that we depend totally on the lord in everything say I mean, it's not like we can go do something and God's not involved in it at some level for we who are his children. He is involved in everything that we do, good and bad. Uh, yet he uses those situations and circumstances in our lives to develop us, to make us more christ -like. He uses the bad to show us where we shouldn't be. And if you look at Romans 7, I think Paul talks about that really well. You know, those things I don't want to do, that's what I end up doing. Wretched man that I am, who's going to relieve me from this existence, these problems? 
but it's because God uses that. As a matter of fact, the way he talks about it is that once we come into Christ Jesus, it's like sin is in us, but it's not of us. You know, we are the Lord's because the Holy Spirit dwells in us, but it's like sin has its own life within us. And that's what he's talking about, that it's, I didn't want to sin. I know better than that, but yet I do sin. What's wrong with me? And it's, it's that separation. It's that struggle between the spirit and the flesh that goes on every day. And I keep mentioning that verse, Galatians 5, 16. If we walk by the spirit, we won't carry out the deeds of the flesh. Easier said than done. But what we see is that this is all how God works to develop us, to bring us out of that darkness into his marvelous light. And we're going to see that in Joseph. I mean, I really like Joseph a lot. I mean, he, he probably had a little bit of problems, you know, controlling what he said as a youth. But hey, as a youth, you're still learning, you know. And I think and because of that, it kind of antagonized his brothers, even though it was true. It antagonized his family. So we're going to talk about that. But the only reason I bring this up is because there is this type of growth development through Joseph that we can see God uses even today in those who are members of the body of Christ in the church. When we look at the giftedness in Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12, Ephesians 4, and 1 Peter 4, we'll see this used in Joseph. Even back then, before we even knew of, you know, the functions of the Holy Spirit and whatnot, and how God still used those same, same attributes in developing, in this case, Joseph. So any questions before we pray and jump into the scriptures? Yeah, go ahead. Oh, maybe I just heard something. Okay, let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you once again for an opportunity to come together and study your word. We thank you for your amazing wonder and how all the way back, you know, I guess what we would say closer to the beginning, you work the same way then as you work today. You are an amazing, loving God, and you carry out your plan and your purpose through each and every one of us. Let us be surrendered to what you're doing and in each and every one of us and collectively as the body of Christ to be obedient to you <clears throat> and also to do what you would have us do in a way that honors and glorifies you. Open our hearts and minds to this, this wonderful scripture, I pray in Jesus name. Amen. Mm -hmm. oh. yeah. Okay, let me go ahead and bring up the scriptures. We're <laughs> jumping into Genesis chapter 37. Uh, notice Milton, I got it right this time. Uh, <laughs> uh, it, it doesn't happen often, but, you know, I got to throw it out there since I did get it this time. Okay, we finished talking about Esau and him living in Edom, uh, the whole structure of the Edomites and whatnot. But now we're going to come back and we're going to focus on Joseph. Now, remember, uh, all of Jacob's children have been born at this point. Uh, we don't know of any other births that have happened uh, since, you know, uh, since Rachel passed away. And we saw, we already uh, saw that Rachel passed away during Benjamin's birth. And so, so now let's pick up in chapter 37. And it says, Jacob lived in the land of his father's sojournings in the land of Canaan. Now, that was God's covenant with Abraham that that land would be theirs. So, that's why they've been staying there. They they haven't left. I mean, yeah, we know that Abraham sent his servant away to get a wife for Isaac back to Haran or Padan Aram, depending on which way you want to look at it. And then Jacob went there to run away from his brother, who he thought was who he was sure was going to kill him. His parents were behind that, but he spent over twenty years and came back, and he's lived in the land, and he had a second. Uh, episode in seeing God at Bethel, and we see that that was the main place where his heart has changed, and he has become committed to the Lord. The Lord had carried out his vow, as he put it, and so basically Jacob belongs to God. You know, the vow's in place, so Jacob belongs to God, and, and it looks like that's happening, and God protected him from Shechem, too. Remember when Dinah was raped, and the uh, Simon and 
uh, oh, Simon and Levi ended up killing all the males of the Shechem city. We see that God still protected them in, in spite, you know, Jacob was afraid they were all going to be killed, but God has protected them. So he continues to live in the land and they moved down to about the area where uh, Isaac had lived. Now, remember last week we talked about that uh, his father had passed away. And so that's, I mean, we know Isaac's gone. So now it's Jacob. He's the one running God's plan in the land right now. So that's what we have going right there. He's in the land. Now, it, he brings out genealogy again. Genealogy is always important in God's line because it follows the fact that God is saying, this is what I'm doing with you. This is how I'm showing that everything is working out according to plan. Because remember, genealogy is all about, you know, who the offspring are. And he told Abraham and Isaac and Jacob that he was going to multiply them. They would have children like, you know, the stars of the sky and the uh, sea, sand of the seashore and whatnot. So, so that, and one of the things is genealogy also keeps the family in order. And that was God's selection. God's selection is for the people that came from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob down that lineage. They were the chosen people. So he says, now here's where we're at. We're up to Joseph now. And when Benjamin was born, those were the 12 males. And it's believed that he had more daughters than just Dinah. There, there is some scripture that indicates that he had sons and daughters, a plural form of daughter, not just sons and daughter. So here it says, Joseph, being 17 years old, was pastoring the flock with his brothers. Normally, they were, they were shepherds. They, they kept the livestock, okay? It wasn't just sheep, but if you remember, he brought back a whole bunch of different kinds of animals from his Laban's, Uncle Laban's farm. So, so they had to take care of all this, these animals, and that was their primary function. So he was a boy. He was a boy with the sons of Bilhah and Zilpah, his father's wives, okay? Now, these were the two, Bilhah and Zilpah were the two servant ladies that were servants to Rachel and Leah, okay? And Joseph brought a bad report to them of them to their father, okay? Now, we see uh, we see that as, as he's bringing back this report, he's telling on his brothers, okay? <laughs> now, uh, you, you know how well that's going to go over, right? Yeah. 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 <laughs> We know that when a sibling tells on another sibling, you know, and I know when we would tell our, when I would tell my parents on my brother or sisters, you know what would happen? If it was a bad thing, we'd all get it, you know? Yeah. <laughs> it's like, uh, it, so it didn't pay to tell on my siblings, okay? But anyway, <laughs> but we see this is, remember the problem we had with Isaac? that Isaac loved Esau and we know that Rebecca loved Jacob you know there was so there was a kind of a division there right because somebody was held more special by one of the parents well look at what happens apparently this didn't go away now Israel talking about Jacob loved Joseph more than any of the other of his sons apparently more than Benjamin okay so apparently Joseph has become Jacob's favorite, because he was the son of his old age. I mean, to me, when I read that, I was thinking, no, Benjamin was the the one that came last. So you would think that he would be the one. But in this case, we see that Joseph is the one, the favorite of Jacob. And apparently it was well known in the family. So look what he does. And this is one of those Sunday school stories we heard as kids, right? The coat of many colors. And he made him a robe of many colors. But now that would have set him apart, right? <laughs> He's got this special robe and none of the other 11 you know, sons had a special robe like this. So verse four, but when his brother saw that their father loved him, notice loved him, not just liked or cared, but loved him more than all his brothers 
look at what happens. And hey, it happens today. It hasn't changed. They hated him and could not speak peacefully to him. And that's, wouldn't you say that that's the same problem that we saw with Cain and Abel? Cain was jealous of Abel. Now, granted, this wasn't something that we saw that Adam cared more for Cain or more for Abel. But the issue was, is that God was more pleased with uh, Abel's sacrifice than he was with Cain's. And so that's what caused Cain to kill Abel. He was jealous, right? But in this case, we see, we see that things haven't changed. They've been going that way ever since the second generation. We see that same old problem. Hatred is there. Uh, we see jealousy is there. And it's not good because what does jealousy normally lead to? Or at least we've seen it with Cain and Abel. Murder. Murder. And hatred also leads that way, doesn't it? So we're headed down that same track. And he hated him and could not speak peacefully to him. Now, if I if I was Joseph, I'd be asking dad, hey, dad, stop stop this you know i don't want a special robe or but jacob i mean joseph obviously was too young to understand uh, yeah at 17 probably but you know so he's he's not getting the best from in terms of relationship from his brothers right and now now i i like this in verse five because you know how even today the God gifts people with different gifts through the Holy Spirit. You know, as we are the body of Christ, he gifts each one according to the common good, as 1 Corinthians 12 talks about. And Mary had asked for us to do a study kind of on the Holy Spirit. And we touched on 1 Corinthians 12, Romans 12, Ephesians 4, 1 Peter 4, as we were looking at how the Holy Spirit brings these gifts to bear and why they're there what good do they do how do they function in the church but it's all god's doing remember it's all through the holy spirit because it's there to make the church into this this family that the world sees and would know them as being separate by their love and the gifts that the Holy Spirit gives contribute to the common good of developing this image that the world seeks, which should be this image of love and caring for one another. Something that the world doesn't really do because the world says, I look out more for number one than I'm looking out for the common good, okay? But we see that in a sense here, Joseph is getting this gift of, of dream interpretation of insight um and uh and like word of knowledge all of these are are gifts that god has given joseph and put in his being and you say why did he have this dream gift at this point well we'll see as we go through that god uses this as part of how he's using joseph to save his family and you say wait he's 17 he's going to save his family how's he going to do that well, keep thinking about that as we go through that what Joseph is doing is carrying out the covenant plan that God had made through Abraham. Because, hey, if if uh, Jacob's family was to die, where would the covenant be, right? But we see that Joseph played an integral part in making sure this happened, that they stayed alive and continued to thrive. So... Now we see Joseph has a dream, right? In verse five. And, but now the thing is, Joseph doesn't know anything but just, hey, let me just go tell it, right? He's not thinking about how will they interpret this or anything like this. He just has it and he feels I have to go share it. So he says, and when he told it to his brothers, <laughs> look what happened. They hated him even more. Uh-oh. Uh, we, we see that this thing's not going down a good road, okay? I mean, uh, where hatred is building, that's not good. And the other thing about hatred is it brings bitterness too, doesn't it? And mm. that's not a good character value either, but I, they're bitter towards him along with his hatred. So let's see what happens. So in verse six, Joseph is just going to be this wonderful, loving brother because he wants to share his dream with them, right? So he said to them, hear this dream that I have dreamed. In a sense, it almost sounds a little arrogant in the way it's worded, 
But hey, it's in other words, look at what I've got, right? Here's here's a dream that I've dreamed. And and this isn't uh uh anyway, yeah. But anyway, uh so verse seven. Uh behold, we are we were binding sheaves in the field, and behold, my sheep arose and stood upright. Yeah, I am the king's sheep, right? And behold, your sheaves gathered around it and bowed down to my sheep. Now, I don't think it takes a, a really good dream interpreter to draw some conclusions from that dream, right? <laughs> it's like, okay, uh-huh. So you're saying we're all going to bow down to you, right? Okay. So in verse 8, his brother said to him, are you indeed to reign over us? Or are you indeed to rule over us? Look at this. Here, here we go. Third time. So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. Okay, we've got a three score, you know, or a three time uh, version of hatred already building here. I mean, it hasn't gotten yeah. any better. Okay. So you you would think that Joseph is catching the hint by this point, but look what happened. <laughs> God gives him another dream, right? In verse 9. Then he dreamed another dream and said, Behold, I have dreamed another dream. Oh, yeah. I'm sure this is really adding to the peace in, amongst the siblings. Behold, <laughs> the sun, the moon, and the love. Now, when you look at sun and moon, what would you take those as metaphors for? Parents, maybe? You know, the father and the mother, so to speak, sun and moon. And 11 stars, oh, now he has 11 brothers, were bowing down to me. Uh-oh. But notice, though, he tells his father this, too. But when he told his father and to his brothers, his father rebuked and said to him, What is this dream that you have dreamed? Now, look, Jacob's also drawn his conclusions. Shall I and your mother, see, sun and moon, and your brothers, stars, indeed come to bow ourselves to the ground before you? And his brothers were jealous. Ah, here we go. Here's the jealousy part of the hatred, right? We're jealous of him. But notice, I like this, but his father kept the saying in mind. Remember with Mary and Luke chapter 1? Uh, and, and in other parts of Luke, remember it said, but Mary remembered and treasured that in her heart. It's mm -hmm. like they know that there's something significant about it, and even though they may not fully grasp it, but they know there's something and they treasure it. It's something that they say, oh, th there's something in this. You know, maybe they're not real clear, but yeah, go ahead, Mel. Yeah, in those days, it was common for God to work through dreams. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, Jacob is obviously seeing something here. He doesn't understand it because he's interpreting it pretty much the same way that uh, Joseph's brothers are. Right. Yeah. But they don't understand it. They just are taking it as, hey, th that's pretty arrogant, Joseph. You know, who do you think you are? And that's pretty much how they've taken it. They don't they're not looking at it as, hey, this is God's message to us. They don't see Joseph yet as God using him with this gift of dreams, okay? So, and we saw somebody else in the Bible that had a gift of dreams, right? Who was that? Daniel. Daniel, exactly. So, I mean, we see that God does use these, these ways of communicating and bringing out information into the world. So. So we see that that's there. Now, we know that there's a bit of antagonism going on right now. So now notice what happens. The brothers have their own plan. They've already got, you know, uh, their bitterness, hatred, and jealousy is already built up to the max. And uh, they, they're they obviously already colluding on how they're going to do something with Joseph. Okay. I mean, it's gotten pretty bad for them to go get reach this point. So in verse 12, now his brothers went to pasture their father's flock near Shechem. Now Shechem, remember, that's that land that they bought where Dinah got raped. Mm -hmm. And that's where they killed all those men, you Quiet. know, 
that it's the same land, but uh, but apparently, hey, it still belongs to them. And obviously God's been protecting them so they can still go back there. And so they had taken some of their flocks there and they went up to that place. And in verse 13, and Israel said to Joseph, are not your brothers pastoring the flock at Shechem? Come, I will send you to them. In other words, hey, go get a report from me. Go check on them, make sure everything's okay. Now, see, the thing is, when you're sending your son to report on how the rest of them are doing, how do you think that looks to the brothers, too? <laughs> not not real good, right? <laughs> so he says, Come, I, will, <laughs> I will send you to them. And he said to him, and this is Joseph, here I am. In other words, uh, uh, whatever you say, dad. So he said to him, go now and see if it is well with your brothers and with the flock. And bring me word. In other words, you know, hey, tell me if, if these guys are towing the line or not. Basically, that's what he's saying. Are they doing what I want them to be doing? Or are they doing their own thing out there? Mm -hmm. So he sent them from the valley of Hebron and he came to Shechem. So that's where they were. Hebron was where they had settled. And he goes there. He goes all the way to Shechem. And a man found him wandering in the fields. And the man asked him, what are you seeking? And in verse 16, I'm seeking my brothers, he said. Tell me, please, where they are pastoring the flock. Now, obviously, these uh, Jacob and his sons were known because, I mean, J uh, it, I mean, Joseph could just say, hey, you know, he understood who he was talking about when he saw Joseph. He knew that he was talking about his brothers and their flock. And so the man said, verse 17, they have gone away, for I heard them say, let us go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them at Dothan. Well, at least Joseph doesn't stop and say, well, they're not at Shechem, so I'm just going back home to dad. And he, he at least is following his dad's order. He's going to go find them. And he goes and he does find them at Dothan. So he keeps going. Now, these these places aren't real close together, so. It takes a little while to, to get going around. So let me see if this map here shows Dothan and Hebron. <coughs> and because it's in this area right here. Let me see here. Okay. Come on. Okay. Here's Hebron right here, about the middle part of the Dead Sea to the west. And uh, then he goes... <laughs> Here's Shechem up here to the north, and then Dothan is further to the north, you know, just south of Mount Tabor. Can you guys see that? Yeah. Okay. Hebron, Shechem, and Dothan. So they were he had to go all the way to the north to get to this place. Um, so they're up there, and in verse 18, they saw him from afar. Okay, so obviously they've, they've got some lookouts. They've been watching. They see him coming, and they've recognized him as Joseph. And before he came near to them, look what they have done. They conspired against him, notice, to kill him. Well, sounds just like Cain, right? He, he waited for his brother, and he killed him. And so he says, they said to one another, here comes this dreamer. Come now, let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits. Then we will say that a fierce animal has devoured him, and we will see and we will see what will become of his dreams. Okay, so they've gone to the nth degree in terms of what they're willing to put up with because of their anger, their jealousy, their rage, all that, right? So verse 21, but when Reuben heard it, Reuben's about the only one that's halfway level-headed, okay? When Reuben heard it, I don't think Reuben wanted to go that far. I mean, I think he wanted to teach the boy a lesson, but this is not what he wanted. He rescued him. Uh, he rescued him out of their hands, saying, let us not take his life. And Reuben said to them, shed no blood. Throw him into this pit here in the wilderness, but do not lay a hand on him. In other words, with the implication, hey, he's going to die in the pit, so hey, we don't got to worry about it. That was his 
plan, but he's got a little bit more to the plan. And he's thinking, well, if I if they put him in this pit, I can come back later and look what he says, that he might rescue him out of their hand to restore him to this father. So Reuben was trying to think of a way to kind of get around the brothers wanting to kill him. But if let's say this had worked and he got Joseph back to the family, do you think that this would have appeased everything? Mm -hmm. Uh, it'll probably have made it worse, right? Because the boys would have seen that Ro Reuben had gone against them and not done. And plus, what would Joseph have said? You know, they threw me into a pit, Dad. Look at, they did it. Yeah. <laughs> they wanted to kill me, Dad. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that would have gone over well, right? So, So we see that this is going on. So in verse 23. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the robe of many colors. The, oh, yeah, the robe of many colors that he wore. And they took him and threw him into the pit. Now, the pit was empty. There was no water in it. So it wasn't like Jeremiah being thrown into that mucky pit that was just kind of sucked him into the mud. I mean, the pit was dry. And in essence, probably about the safest pit you could be thrown into. Uh, yeah, doesn't sound like fun, though, right? So, but there's no water in it. So in that sense, it was good. And, and then they just like forgot the boy and said, then they sat down to eat and looking up, they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead with their camels and they were bearing gum, balm, and myrrh on their way to carry it down to Egypt. Now, these are traders, okay? They don't care. They didn't just trade in, uh, you know, gum, balm, and myrrh. They traded anything. So they they didn't have a problem, you know, with trading people, too. I mean, because remember, slavery was a common thing in that time. And hey, as long as you paid the money and the person was there, that was good enough for them. And so the now Reuben, for some reason, has gone away. He's not there with them when the 11 or, or, the, or the 10 are there. So look what these 10 say. Then Judah... Now, what was Jesus called? The Lion of Judah? Yeah. But look who's the one that does the, the initial, you know, idea to do something with, uh, with Joseph. Then Judah said to his brothers, hey, what profit is it if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Now he's thinking he's a businessman now at this point. Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites. And let not our hand be upon him. Well, you know, yeah, so he's justifying it. Well, he is our brother, our own flesh. I mean, hey, better for him to go down there and be some slave to an Egyptian than that we kill him directly and be responsible directly for his blood. Let them kill him down there. Then it's not on us that way. <laughs> what a way to rationalize it, right? So, and look, and his brothers listened to him. In other words, hey, yeah, good idea, Judas. Uh, Judah, not Judas. Yeah, even though he's being betrayed. <laughs> Verse 28. Then Midianite traders passed by, and they drew Joseph up and lifted him out of the pit. Notice that when they sold him, they kind of said, well, he's in that pit over there. Hey, if you want him, you got to get him. So the Midianites went and lifted him out of the pit uh, and... Oh, no, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm reading that wrong. No, his brothers drew him up and lifted him out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver. Now, where have we heard the 20 uh, pieces of silver? Oh, Judas. No, that was 30, wasn't it? Was it th 30 pieces yeah. of silver? Yeah. Oh, okay. I was thinking that was 20 uh, in both cases. But, well, uh, What's that? Inflation. Oh, that's what it was. Yeah, inflation. <laughs> <laughs> but but it's still the same thing, right? Being sold out in that same kind of way. Well, in this case, we see that they've sold Joseph. Uh, but it is uh, uh, basically the same kind of thing that happened to Jesus. I mean, he was sold down the river, so to speak. Well, he's being sold down the river. And we see these kind of signs 
that kind of point toward what's going to happen, you know, like with the Lord. And in this case, that kind of looks like it get, kind of gives us an insight to something that's going to happen that God's given us some insight to. So he does get sold, okay? And they took Joseph to Egypt. These are the Ishmaelites. They go down there. Now, when they get there, they're going to sell him off, right? So Lotus in verse 29, when Reuben returned to the pit and saw that Joseph was not in the pit, see, Reuben thought he was going to save them. He tore his clothes and returned to his brother and said, the boy is gone. And I, where shall I go? In other words, I'm the older brother. I'm responsible. Now what's going to happen? Where am I to go? How am I going to tell dad about this? I'm the one that's responsible. So here's what they conceived to do in verse 31. Then they took Joseph's robe and slaughtered a goat and dipped the robe in, a robe in blood. And in a sense, we get another picture. What happened to Jesus' clothes when he was put on the cross? They cast lots. They cast lots for the main part of his robe, and they sold the other parts that, that they didn't that they could tear up, right? So in a sense, we're seeing something very similar of blood and clothes. You know, we kind of see that parallel being drawn here and and so we see that Jesus shed blood, but his clothes were sold. And we see that even prophesied later on. Uh, so in verse 32, and they sent the robe of many colors and brought it to their father and said, this we have found. Please identify whether it is your son's robe or not. Now, of course, they already know. And now their dad doesn't know what's going on. So he's taking their word to be factual, that they're not lying to him. And here's what Jacob does in verse 33. And he identified and said, it is my son's room. Uh, and he draws this conclusion, just what they wanted him to draw. A fierce animal has devoured him. Joseph is without doubt torn to pieces. And so verse 34, then Jacob tore his garment and put sackcloth on his loins, and mourned for his son many days. Of course, I mean, it was his favorite boy, right? And now his boy is gone. And in a sense, you can kind of take a picture of a father with his son, you know, kind of like Abraham having to put Isaac on the altar. In a sense, Joseph is gone. As, as far as he's concerned, Joseph's dead. Now, it's not his only son, like we would see, you know, in terms of God sending his only son, but still, it's a beloved son. And so in verse 35, and all his sons and daughters rose up to comfort him, which is normal, but he refused to be comforted and said, no, I shall go down to Sheol to my son mourning. In other words, all my life, I'm going to be mourning for my son. So thus, his father wept for him well a, a father for his son yeah of course and in this case it was his favorite son so now we jump forward to the midianites getting to egypt and verse 30 says meanwhile the midianites had sold him in egypt to potiphar an officer of pharaoh he was the officer of the guard the captain of the guard so apparently you know uh he 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 brought a good price for him to go to the captain of the guard. This was not just a, a, a regular selling. This went to a high level official. So that means he that these Ishmaelite traders got a good price for him. OK, I mean, if he had gotten a price from somebody just a regular normal grade, they wouldn't have gotten that much of a price. But from him, somehow Joseph must have looked good on the bartering block for the slaves. So we see that uh, Potiphar makes a good investment here because, I mean, what we'll see is that one of the big things that we have to understand is that when God uses somebody, he's always with them. And God will carry out his plan and purpose through the people that are surrendered to him and that give in to his will. Well, that's one of the things that Joseph was strong in, is that he did love God. 
yeah, he may have been a little bit, you know, loose with his words as he was younger, not not having the wisdom yet to be able to understand how to be able to interact and in what he knew and what he saw in it that God had given him in his dreams. But one of the things is that he probably was the strongest in faith of all of his brothers. And we see that in his life. I mean, he stays firm to the Lord. He he has this moral compass that is right in his life. Now, remember, Joseph is, is alive at a time before there's a law. You know, now some laws or rules have been set down by God at the Noahic covenant. You know, after Noah had sacrificed, remember God gave some rules, talked about like if somebody kills somebody, you know, basically the eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth kind of thing. And and he set down some requirements. Uh, it, there are those that call that an age of government. You know, basically it was an age of government up until the age of the law, which was at Moses' time when God gave the law to the Jews. But up to that point, it was more of a kind of a moral kind of uh, situation that was established with certain rules that were in place. Because before the flood, remember, it was all about an age of innocence. There were no rules. There were no laws. There was nothing established that said, hey, here's what you have to do and here's what you don't do. It was pretty much where their hearts led them. And so we see that eventually their hearts all led them to do evil. And it was constant, continually evil is what it talked about, you know, in their lives, you know, because of their fallen natures. There was nothing to control that. So at least after the flood, there was some level of control. But. We see that that level of control, though, was very good in Joseph. Joseph had a pretty good sense of what was right and what was wrong, what was good and what was not good. And we see that he does trust the Lord. I think he does better than Jacob does in terms of his trust of the Lord. You know, it took Jacob a long time to come to a place where he finally really surrendered to the Lord. And maybe that's why Jake, uh, Joseph came about, you know, trusting the Lord more, because think about when Joseph was born. Joseph was born just before he left Laban's camp. So Joseph would have been brought up from the time that Jacob had finally come into the place where he was trusting God, like we saw in the previous chapter when he went back to Bethel again, when God called him to go up to Bethel again. And that's where we really see his surrender to the Lord. And so from that time, that's when Joseph would have been this type. And possibly Jacob, since Joseph was his favorite, was bringing him up in the way of the Lord, which would have made better sense because his other brothers would have been more subject to the antagonism that was going on between Laban and Jacob. So they had a lot of that character value in them. That's what they saw. That's what they got brought up with. And they would have had a different kind of character in them than what Joseph and probably Benjamin would have had because they would have been younger. They would have had the opportunity to be brought up in a time after that conflict with, between Joseph or between Jacob and uh, Laban. So the only reason I bring that up is because as we get into this next chapter, you're going to see how God does work through jo Joseph. And notice, Joseph's life isn't this panacea. In other words, this place of always having everything good happen to him, nothing bad happens to him. You know, a lot of times, many believers today think that, well, since I'm a believer, God should just take care of me. I should never have problems in my life. I should never be sick. I should never, you know, have any antagonism with others. I should just be this person that is at peace with everybody. And I have everything I need and no problems because I belong to the Lord. Well, that's that's not reality because we live in a fallen world. Even we Christians, we have to continually be transformed by the renewing of our minds, as Romans 12, 2 talks about, because we do live in a fallen world, and much of that renewal requires us going through sometimes 
that can be really trying in our lives. But God uses them all for good, okay? And he, because he's developing us to be more Christ-like, because that's what he wants. We've said this before in Romans 8. He wants us to be conformed to the image of his son. That's the Father's will for you and me, is that we look more like Jesus every day. And it, it's through these times that when we go through them, whether we see them as good or bad, that our eyes continually stay on the Lord. And that we know that he's using every single situation in our lives to conform us to the image of Jesus Christ, to become more like Jesus. I know that that's not a, a real popular teaching in the church today, because there's a lot of this health, wealth, and prosperity gospel out there. There's a lot of this new age teaching. Uh, there's a lot of this universalism that just seems to want to focus on the good. But the reality is, as since the father loves us, he says, just like, you know, your earthly father loves you and wants good for you, your heavenly father even more. But yet in the process, it also says that those who God loves, he disciplines, you know, because, I mean, that's how we get developed. Discipline is like training. And the Bible also says that discipline at the time may not be pleasant for the moment. You know, because, I mean, some of the discipline may be something we have to go through that's kind of rough, might be something tough. We'll see that in Joseph. I mean, I mean, he's already gone through some tough stuff. He's now a slave, for heaven's sakes. You know, I mean, he's the, the favorite in a chosen family by God one day, and then he sold off to the Ishmaelites, you know, shortly thereafter. And then he lives apart from his family for a couple of few decades before he sees him again, you know, as a slave before he's, you know, before God puts him in this very special position. So, I mean, when you look at that, though, God was orchestrating his life. And he does the same today. He orchestrates your and my life today. That's why we need to continually get to know him better through his word, through these Bible teachings that we have together, interaction with each other, caring about each other. And even when we go through tough times, we can always look to him and say, "Is are you trying to teach me something today through this situation I'm going through? Please help me to understand it and to learn from it in a way that makes me more Christ-like in everything that you're accomplishing in and through me. And that's how God works, you know. I mean, he works through our situation here on earth. He doesn't take us out of it, you know. We have to develop within it, but yet he can put a hedge of protection around us, but that doesn't mean that through the hedge of protection, we won't go through tough times. It just means that he is always with us and we can always hold on to his hand as we're going through it, and he is our strength and our power to go through it, no matter what the situation looks like. And I keep saying this too, remember to keep looking to the Lord when everything is going relatively well. I see too many Christians that think, well, I'm being blessed, so I I'm good to go, everything's fine. Well, if you're not seeking the Lord during the good times, when the tough times come, you're gonna have to start from scratch. And you're not going to understand it. You're not going to understand why God is having you go through it. But if you're seeking him continually, looking in his word, renewing your mind, when those things come, the Holy Spirit will show you what it is that you're, what you're going through and why you're going through it, what he's trying to do in and through you. And we can surrender to him and say, yes, Lord, I want that in my life. Because that's what brings you honor and glory and fulfills your plan through me. Like we said, Romans 8, 28, right? He works all things out for good to those who love God and are called not to what they want, but according to his purpose. And he works his purpose out through his loved ones, his children, his family. So that's why we just need to be there, you know, surrendered to him in all situations. Any questions, comments, agreements, disagreements?
Yeah, Joseph yeah. is a really good guy. I, mm -hmm. I like studying about him because I'll tell you, he yeah. he he is strong in the Lord. Um a, a lot stronger than I've been in some cases, you know. So yeah, go ahead, Milton. I was just thinking, you know, they didn't have television all that. They communicated by telling stories. And uh, Joseph being the one of the younger sons. Right. May have been closer to his father and listened to his stories about how he met God and all this sort of stuff. But now he's off in Egypt. Yeah. He doesn't have his father anymore to rely on. That's right. Where is he going to look? He's got to look around and say, uh, Lord, uh, God of my father, <laughs> help me. Amen. I hear him saying that every night before he goes to bed or something. And that's the beautiful thing, too. I think he learned that God was with him all the time. You know, because did we ever do we ever see a place where God reveals himself to Joseph like he did to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob? No. I don't remember anything either where God specifically comes and talks to him like he did to them. No. So I think his faith was strong enough to where God didn't feel he had to do it with him. Right. Just uh, in the dreams. Yeah, just in what he was showing him in the dreams. But Joseph understood that that came from God. So, I mean, obviously... You know, I think, like you're saying, I think what he heard from Jacob really resonated in him to where it became his lifestyle. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that's great because, I mean, when I look at things like that, I realize Jacob didn't need that. You know, I yeah. mean, he was strong in and of himself, but yet he still relied on God through it all. Yeah. Kind of think of the good soil and the bad soil, you know. Yeah, he was receptive. Exactly. And, and God was able to do his best work in that soil. Yeah. 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 He's I, I really like Joseph. I mean, you know, sometimes I look at him and I say, man, I wish I had a lot of those character values that Joseph displayed, you know, and it's like, Lord, just develop me just to be because, I mean, I don't want to be Joseph. I want to be Ted. But I want to be the Ted God wants me to be. Right. You know, because I mean, that's uh, that's how we all are. It's not about competition. It's not about like being somebody else, because each of us is developed and created for His plan and purpose. Our, you know, how He has developed for each and every one of us individually. Yeah. That's reminds me of when God was calling me to serve Him, surrender to serve Him. You know, I, I finally gave up and said, well, OK, if you think you can do anything with me, go have at it. <laughs> I think you're worth too much. <laughs> Amen. And I think that that's a that's I think that that right there is the key issue is when we humble ourselves before him. He says, now I can use. You. Yeah. You know. Um, and and he's the perfecter of our faith. You know, when you think about it. I mean, Hebrews tells us that that's what the Lord does. He perfects our faith. You know, he is the one that begins it and perfects it in us in terms of our walk with him. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, Any other questions, comments, agreements, disagreements? Yeah. Well, next week's will really be good, too, because, I mean, we're going to see... Uh, you know, uh, something that, you know, you would say, how would I have fared if I was Joseph and I had to go through everything that Joseph did? Would I have been as strong as he? Would I have been as focused as he? Would I have been as surrendered as he to the Lord? I mean, it makes you think about, OK, where would my trust be or would I be afraid because of the situation, you know, and my my condition? You know, being a slave can't be a, a, this joyful thing. You know what I mean? <laughs> I, I would have been crying through the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gee, God, oh, why you got me in this? Doing? What's happening to me? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> uh, that's life, right? That's yeah. life. Okay, we ready for prayer time? Yeah.
Okay, let me stop the recording here and we'll go into prayer.